cheers <laughs> i'm doing good how are you mm. super busy i'm finishing my um training programs for the Windrock organization. I'm training uh, South Cameroon refugees in uh, at the border of Nigeria, in South Nigeria. And so I'm doing all the train to trainer kind of a thing. And I'm just kind of scrambling, putting the slides together and the things and the live uh, training starts tomorrow. So I'm, Ooh, I'm my ears on fire. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're busy. Wait, you mean yeah. it's, is that way it's red? Yes, that, because it's always on fire. <laughs> it's always on fire. And I do it to myself, honestly. Yeah, well, that that makes me feel like I have not accomplished very much. Um... <laughs> oh, no, that was not meant for that. You know, no, no I, I know, I know. I'm just picking on you. I did. That's my passion. We finished the, um, well, we have the shed expansion completely enclosed and the base panels of the roof and the walls are up so it's actually enclosed and things can be put inside of it now so that was the the three-day weekend project was getting all that up got the rafters up got the plywood down for the roofing um still have to do the shingles on the top and then we've got the raw cut because the original building the sides were raw cut cedar mm -hmm. and so we moved that original side wall out to the new exterior wall but the front and the back, um, I haven't been able to get a hold of enough of the cedar yet to do it. So it is just paneling at the moment. Um, but it's all enclosed. So it, it's it's quote unquote weatherproof ish so that I can put stuff in there, which is a, a good good project accomplishment for me. But beyond that, um, yeah, I don't I don't have any uh any big that's a lot of busy work. I mean, that takes a long time to do all this stuff. And I know it's for beekeeping as well as the chickens. So it counts, right? Yeah, well, yeah, because it's it's to store all that Langstroth stuff. That's right. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah, the chickens haven't got their expansion started yet. I have started the poles that are going to go out and around uh, to make the new run. And there's there's two enclosures. So there's a little mini enclosure up towards the front now where I can put like the new chicks that are down here with me. Mm -hmm. um, I can put them in there or I can use it as a quarantine area, you know, things like that if need be. And then that's it. The rest mm -hmm. of it's all been the shed. So now mm -hmm. that the, the, the shed expansion is done, I can actually start expanding the interior of the roost area for the chickens and then obviously finish doing the posts. The post is the suckiest part because digging out here sucks. It, I mean, oh. It's rock. I don't feel bad for you. We're on Kalichi <laughs> over here, right? Yeah. No, this is this is like it's a it's a whole bunch of mixed granite and limestone, and yeah, it's it's so bizarre because the soil is so fertile and rich because of all the leaves and the pine needles and stuff that decompose in it. Worms everywhere. Oh, that's awesome. That's good for plants. That means there should be good forage. It should be, but there's also so many trees that there's not much that grows down on the undercover area. But um, yeah, but there's a lot of freaking rocks. <laughs> yeah, well, so, that's no fun. I don't like digging rocks. No, digging rocks is not, it's not a fun task. So anyhow, uh, so, and what did I do? I just, I reached over and picked that up. You did. <laughs> saw you were talking how you fiddle with your Velcro while we're <laughs> recording and it's I pretty static <laughs> Worked so hard at eliminating in the first place. Yep, I looked down, I saw the strap, and I picked it up. I should throw it on the floor or something, but then I'll be yeah, go going, for it. Go? <laughs> <laughs> so today we are going to talk about different scenarios on when the queen is possibly the problem and when she's not the problem. And mm -hmm. this is based primarily on the fact that. As I have said many, 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 many times over, mm -hmm. Facebook and YouTube are the devil. <laughs> and mm -hmm. unfortunately, there, there's, there's more misinformation out there than there is. I, just, I picked it up again. I can see it. It has to go away. <laughs> telling you throw it away for now. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of misinformation out there because anybody can get on there and they can say their thoughts and their opinions. And, and that's that. There is good information out there from reputable sources but you have to look really hard to find it it's not the the most immediate thing that's going to pop up and well, so and the other thing is that uh, you have to know that it's good information how do you know you got to do research you know. <laughs> yeah you got to you got to know who the individual is which means at right. some point you had to have either been introduced to them or researched them or something or, or knew something about them to know oh this person might know what they're talking about right but Nine times out of 10, when you first get started in beekeeping and you go out there and you're looking for somebody to help you out, uh, Facebook 
Instagram and a lot of the forums online end up being one of the first places you go. Or some clubs even. This is true. That's actually very true. In person, in some of the clubs, you can run into this exact same scenario. But the, the thing that you hear more times than not, it doesn't matter what it is. You can post a picture of damn near anything and somebody, usually one of the first somebodies, is going to respond and say, it's your queen's fault. You need to requeen. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't matter. They don't ask questions. They don't get the depth, the behind the scenes, what's really going on. It's just your queen. You got to requeen. So a scenario that popped up that I saw a recent post of, which is what kind of brought this back to the forefront of my mind. And I thought it would be kind of a fun little um, thought experiment to walk through different scenarios of was a posting that was titled, I had to kill my queen to save my colony. Hmm. And at a very, very, very high level superficial viewpoint is how we're going to look at this because I'm going to pose this to you and then ask you what you think the solution would have been. <laughs> to be clear, I didn't get the ans- the questions ahead of time. Nope. That was a big requirement. <laughs> You're going right. to be put on the spot and we're going to work through this. <laughs> That's right. She was like, do I get to have the questions ahead of time? Can I have a minute to think about it? And I was like, nope. <laughs> I want yeah, the knee jerk. Be- yeah, I want the knee jerk reaction. Okay. Um, but these are, but these are, again, these are very common scenarios that we, we experience ourselves, but you see things like that online all the time. And so the whole point of what I want to try to encourage is a little bit of not necessarily critical thinking, but, but logical thinking. And a lot of it stems from knowing bees, knowing how the colony functions, and then being able to kind of switch out different scenarios and come up with a hypothesis as to what may be the problem that's a little bit deeper than just, oh, requeen the colony. Okay. And that, that's not to say, because, uh, and also, as you have mentioned many times, and we've talked about many times, sometimes requeening is the answer, especially right. if genetics are the issue and you need to do these other things, then yes, but that's not always the, it's not the silver bullet. So, no. um, okay, well, so here's- I was going to say, it's not only not always a silver, it's not a silver bullet by, by definition, and it also can do harm in right. sometimes. So we'll talk about that. Yeah. Okay, so here's the first scenario that we'll start off with on this. And this is the one that I that I saw posted online. And again, very high level, superficial, nothing super in-depth. Okay, so you've got a Langstroth colony. It has mm-hmm. four boxes on it. Every time you've gone out there and checked it, the colony has been the sweetest, most gentle colony ever. Let's say you check it twice a month. So every two to three weeks. All of a sudden you go out there to check it and they're mean as hell the last time you checked it, they were just normal, perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. But now you go out there and you check it and they're mean as hell. And it's only been two weeks, maybe three at the most. So is uh, the solution, I I have to find my queen and kill her and requeen my colony because that's what they did. (laughs) No, 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 no. So uh, my need, it's actually a very visceral reaction, as you can tell. Um, Basically, if it's genetics, it doesn't happen um, overnight, right? Right. It happens progressively um, as the colony develops and and takes, you know, a larger size. It also is um, progressive when the colony gets larger. But if they were fine last week uh, or two weeks ago, they're not that much bigger, not enough anyway to justify a complete change of temperament from sweet to mean. So what that tells me logically is that those are environmental factors and they range from my first case would be, um, they might have lost their queen. That, that's a big so one that makes that's, them- That's exactly right. That's one thing right there. I'm gonna have to go find my queen so I can replace her. Well, maybe you don't have one. Maybe that's the problem and that's, that's why right. they're irritable. <laughs> that's right. So that's a, that's a one that might require some deeper inspection. However, I would say before you even Uh, you even do that you kind of need to read the colony and see what their behavior their their um their resources and things um as well to see if there's an issue with a non-present queen maybe you rolled her last time but then you're not going to see um a lot of new brood you're not going to see all kinds of things that you would see if you had a queen in there so that's also going to inform your evaluation yeah. Right. So let's let's make it it's a tiny bit easier on on the new beekeepers. Let's say you ordered a marked queen. Uh-huh. So you know she has hypothetically a yellow dot. Mm-hmm. So 
you're going to now break apart this colony to, to find your queen. You do find your queen. She still has the yellow dot. She's the same okay. queen that's been in there for a year, you know, okay. or whatever. So as you mentioned, the change doesn't happen instantaneously. So if you were looking for that yellow dot and you don't find her, you find a queen that has no markings at all. She's a different coloration. Clearly they've requeened themselves. That is still a minimum of a six week transition where you're going to notice them slowly starting to change their behavior as the new generations take over, but it's not an right. instantaneous one week to the next. But in this scenario, your yellow dotted queen is still there. So right, and 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 if they did requeen themselves because they lost their original yellow dot queen, uh, even that is going to be half their genetics from the sweet queen, and the chances of them being dramatically much meaner because they've made themselves a new queen and she went out and made it with drones out there open made it is highly unlikely right uh, so and it's like you said two weeks into it i would actually uh think that's more due to issues that are completely environmental and the next guess would be do they have enough food okay right so if they don't have enough food that makes them very cranky and and um the other environmental factor would be there's been disruptions, uh, predators have scratched at the hives. Uh, they, um, there's weather coming in. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons. There's wind, there's uh, changes in barometric pressure and or humidity levels or um, something when in the beekeeper mode around the hive. There's all kinds of reasons that can make them mad. But generally speaking, that's tempor temporary. So I'm just gonna uh, say my rule of thumb for this is three strikes and you're out um, kind of a thing for beginner beekeepers, especially the first time around, she might, they might be mean and that might just be a coincidence. Something happened. Second time that happens again. And it's two weeks from now, then you're starting to wonder, mm, maybe they are um, all of a sudden just kind of like not really nice. And something happened where that potentially requeen introduced a lot more meanness into the colony. And then third strike, then that's more because they've grown bigger, in my opinion, and they're just mean. And it's just, but because you said two weeks before they were gentle as And they've as always possible, been gentle. Yeah, they've always now been gentle. And that, that two weeks later, they were mean. That means that really it was environmental. Right. And I highly doubt that second strike and third strike, they're going to be mean. Right. right. Or it, if they are, that's a coincidence or the environmental pressure is still there. Yep. So my thinking is that you really want to evaluate if it's really worth changing your queen, especially if she was mean and was producing really well, because you know what you had. You don't all know what you're getting when you requeen. Right. right. Even if you get your queens from reputable breeders, there might be some issues at some point with a new queen, or she might not be accepted. So you're taking a huge risk every time you requeen, especially for temperament reasons. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that if they're really growing into something mean, that's another scenario, by the way, uh, the genetics be, being at fault, you shouldn't requeen. Yes. I mean, if it's uncomfortable or it becomes dangerous, you should requeen. Right. But it shouldn't be done lightly. Right. And, it, and, and again, that's a gradual progression. You're going to know signs from that. It's not going to be an overnight all of a sudden, oh my God, somebody mm -hmm. like corrupted my colony and they're completely different. You know, that's not how that works. So mm -hmm. in those different scenarios, and that, that is exactly, you hit literally every single key point <laughs> that I would have talked at. Okay. Um, one of the, one of the things that is very, very, very advantageous for a new beekeeper is having a, bee, a journal, a beekeeping journal. And take notes, even if it's just bullet point notes, take notes when you go out there. And if your journal reads, you know, today was 75 degrees, there was no wind, it was a beautiful blue sky, flowers blooming everywhere, bees were in a great mood. And that's kind of the, the general synopsis for most of your beekeeping journal entries. And then all of a sudden, one day, bees were mad as hell, you know, queen was present, but bees were very upset. What else was going on? Maybe it was overcast. Maybe there was a storm front coming in and the barometric pressure was all over the place. And so the bees mm -hmm. were picking up on that. And then the very next general journal entry reads, you know, beautiful day, 85 degrees, bees were perfectly fine, back to normal. Then it was an environmental factor. It could have also been 
as you said, predation. Maybe a skunk has been coming in the night and scratching on the hive and irritating them all night long. Maybe there was some sort of construction or tree trimming or something nearby that was like very out of the ordinary, very loud, concussive or vibrations and gas and fumes. And so that next day, they're just, they're not having it. And those types of scenarios should not be held against the colony and definitely right. not against the queen right. because it was an outside factor and it was a one-off. And you have to be able to go through and check them again and again and again and know, is this the common denominator? Because if your journal entry reads 75 degrees, flowers everywhere, beautiful, bees are mean as hell. And then the next one is cloudy, bees are mean as hell. The next one's 85, bees are mean as hell. Then mm -hmm. the common denominator is the bees are mean. <laughs> That's right. So then you can make a different kind of assumption on that and, and go through and fix that. But in that scenario, more information needs to be gathered. And that's the same thing whenever you pose a question. If you pose a question out there and you don't provide any background, any history, any relevant data to it, the answers you're going to get are very off base, far-fetched and from everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of times if you write into the show over the years when people have done listener questions and stuff, they send them in. The first thing they usually get back is a list of more questions. You know, right. it's like, okay, well, where are you beekeeping at? What is your scenario? What type of beekeeping do you do? Um, did you check for this? Did you look for that? How about this? And then when we get those answers, then you get a well-formed, educated response based on your specific scenario. Right. And I would go even further. If you're not getting a list of questions from somebody as a preamble to an answer, then maybe you shouldn't trust what that person is doing because they didn't get inf enough information to form a valid opinion on what's happening. Absolutely correct. They're not doing critical thinking on their own mm -hmm. to try and do you the service of giving you the best possible answer by knowing your scenario. Right. So yeah, and that's what you run into on forums and everything else. A lot of times people just wanna be they just want to hear themselves and they want to be the one that's like, I always give the answers. It doesn't mean they're right. right. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, I know people like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> so here's another, here's another scenario where you have just started off with some bees. Mm -hmm. They are, let's say they were a nuke mm -hmm. and you have put them in your colony and you are feeding them profusely. And they're just not growing. Should you requeen your colony? Is it your queen's fault? No. Um, this is what happens when you overfeed a colony, especially a brand new one, and especially a package, but even uh, nukes as well. You end up um, giving them so much food that all they do is bilk them and pack the food into the cells, leaving nowhere for the queen to lay any eggs. You can actually kill your colony that way because all of a sudden they have a failure to thrive. They don't have the population. As the um, bees leave, live uh, four to six weeks on average, you know, half of it is in the house uh, and half of it is as foragers. But if there's no new brood, then they're not gonna be replenishing those losses and the colony will start taking a nosedive. And at one point it will reach a point of no return where they cannot sustain their functions anymore and they will die. And that I've seen it happen very much, uh, very often with people that start with packages or nukes that are young and they feed them tremendously. But it's it like happen. a gallon a, gallon a uh, week. <laughs> this is so bad. And uh, I mean, unless it's a package, a nuke should come with its own food and provisions and should have the troops to go and fetch more and grow with a good rate. A package, which is an artificial swarm, might have some difficulties. There's issues with the stress from transport, the fact that they're not all nurse bees. They were not primed initially as a swarm. There's an artificial swarm and the queen uh, is not yet accepted. So they have to go through all those processes and build the comb. So they're going to need to have a little bit of help initially. That's a highly unnatural situation here. And so you're going to have to feed them. But even then, I would say no more than a quart every five to seven days. And yep. uh, anything more than that, you're, you're starting that cycle I just talked about of overfeeding. Yeah. And that is, that is absolutely correct as well on that one. So see, I told you, yes. you're easy. Is it like a, a JPRD or something? Am I right. getting yeah. for this? Yeah. You're, you're, 
that was the uh, the two thousand dollar category. So now we're gonna move up to the. So. When I get when when do I get my prize? I have a Monopoly board over here, and uh, it's got some really pretty colored money in there. Funny money, funny money. As long as it's not funny, honey, I don't care. No funny, honey, but funny money is okay. Funny money is okay. So. So that that's a, that's absolutely correct, and and the problem that ends up happening with those is that you read like if you're gonna do a package, you should feed them as much as they will absolutely take. But the the problem with that is it goes into a gray area. It's not meant to be black or white. It's not period. That's the end of the story. It's initially that first week when you get them, they need, they don't have any comb. They need to build comb. Once they start building the comb, you need to cut back because if you don't they're immediately going to take it and store it. And even if you're feeding your bees one quart at a time and you have it in a feeder where you can see it, you can go give them that quart of sugar syrup and it will be gone the next morning, but they did not consume it. They took it out of the jar and put it into the cells because that's where they store it. From the cells, they then consume it as needed. So you have to be very careful with that. And you can't go by, oh, well, the jar was empty, so I gave them more. You have to know what's going on inside the colony and inside the cells. And if all the cells are full of liquid and there's nowhere for the queen to lay, well, that's your problem. It's not your queen's fault. It's your fault for overfeeding them. Right. Um, you can have the flip-flop of this scenario too, though. Let's say you're not feeding them and you're in a dearth, especially like if you're in central Texas and it is August. <laughs> my colony is not growing. My queen is not laying. I need to replace my queen because obviously there's something wrong with her. Would that be a correct statement? Not necessarily because exactly. when you have a period of dearth, the queen usually shuts down on the laying to, a, to save energy uh, and consumption of resources because they're not there, right? So they will follow the cycles of weather and forage, uh, especially if they're good because be some certain uh, um, genetics will not do that. And they will keep growing, growing, even though there's no food. Uh, Italians are notorious for doing things like that. And they'll just kind of keep, I call them the dairy cows of bees because they're kind of dumb that way, right? And very often they are imported and um, are very much uh, sold by a lot of the breeders and the commercial beekeepers and exported to other states and they're not adapted and they will do that. <laughs> Excuse well, they're, me. Yeah, they're designed to grow fast and make a lot of honey. Mm -hmm. They are not the, that's the other thing. That's, that's not part of the subject, but that's another misnomer out there. Italians are not the most docile bees. They're not yeah. the nicest bees. They're just the best combination of how much we'll put up with temperament wise versus how much honey they'll produce. Right. And that's it. They're 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 like a number two or three on the scale. They're not the best. <laughs> well, and actually, they can be very bad for your apiary because they're huge robbers. Yep. Right. So that could actually be getting the the fox in the hen house in a way. Sort of. So yeah. You can cause all kinds of other issues. Mm -hmm. But they will they will grow fast, and then they will continue to grow when there's nothing there. That's in the spring. Coming out of winter, late winter, early spring is a big problem for that because the first warm day in your area that you have, they come out. And then if you just happen to feed them because it's going to be warm for two or three days, they think that there's a nectar flow and the temperatures are nice. They're going to immediately brood up like crazy. And, and then all of a sudden there's no food because it's not actually spring yet. Mm -hmm. And then they starve because now they've got all these mouths that they have to feed. And that's why beekeeping, your overwinter losses, especially like down in central Texas area, your winter losses don't happen in December and January. They happen in February and March. Right. <laughs> like it's coming out of winter when all of a sudden certain lineages of bees get a little crazy and, and slap happy and they go, you know, go to town on raising babies when there's no food out there for them. So well, um, my favorite is when people feed them pollen also and yeah. uh, syrup and really push them to brood. I've talked about it before. You can uh, you can destroy your colony like that because either they're going to swarm early before there's drones available to mate with the virgin queens that are left behind, or like you mentioned, they will have so much brood to protect, uh, and the weather's not quite there yet. So they might have to they might run out of food, but also they might even if they have food in the colony, uh, starve to death because they're trying to uh, keep those babies warm yep. and and keep them alive and they might not even be able to get to that honey doing so yep. or they might run out of that fuel really fast and at that point die so well, that's very dangerous for position if you have a colony that does not have any brood present 
they only need to keep their ambient temperature for the cluster about 60 to 65 degrees. Right. If it's there's actually better. present, they have to keep it at 95 degrees. That's a 30 degree increase in there that they've That's got to maintain, heat. which is a huge pull on, like you said, the reserves and the resources to generate that heat. Plus, they're also needing to take those same resources and feed them to the babies to keep them alive. And so you suddenly get like this triple fold increase on resource consumption. Mm -hmm. Well, say you were just feeding them. And, and in this scenario, maybe you were just feeding them a quart a week because right. it was just coming out of winter. And you're like, oh, I'm going to go ahead and give them a little bit of extra. And you got some pollen out there. And then all of a sudden, February of 2021 hits and nobody can go anywhere for a month. Well, a week into that, your bees starved and died because right, you didn't come back you, out there and give them, them more food. <laughs> yeah, you pushed them to get started and it was not the right time. So, yeah. and they're better off doing it themselves. They will do a better job uh, than if we are trying to manipulate and, and, and just kind of change the rules of the game. The other thing is that the fewer mouths you have in that colony, there's a threshold. Right, there's some, yeah, too, too few is uh, dangerous also because they cannot efficiently they the heat. cluster and generate the heat to keep the queen alive. But it doesn't take that many bees, honestly, to keep a colony through the winter. It's when you put in and, and uh, just um, artificially push them to have too many adults in the colony, that actually can also be a problem because that's that many more mouths they get yep. to feed, right? So don't keep huge colonies necessarily over winter. Let them go through the brood breaks and decrease in population. That's the natural cycle. And when it comes to the brood breaks, it gives your queen a rest. And uh, that's what that those dirts do. She stops completely sometimes or uh, slows down very much the laying. And it also um, helps with the population of mites, right? So if you constantly push them to be brooding all the time, your mites are reproducing all the time. Yep. Whereas when you have a brood break, they don't. So yeah. this is the natural way they use, this is their integrated pest management solution uh, to a lot of the uh, pests and diseases. It, uh, it's a kind of a cleansing cycle that you don't want to be um, getting rid of. You want to allow them to have no brood at certain times of the year, the dearth usually, either the summer dearth for Texas or um, the winter dust for just about everybody that has a, a winter so keep that in mind and uh, don't really necessarily think that because there's no brood in the colony, there's no queen or she's right. bad. That's right. You got to always look at those outside factors, read your comb, make mm. sure that you actually understand what's going on inside there and what it means if there's liquid or not liquid and pollen and be able to identify all those different aspects of things because knowing how to understand the ebb and flow of the colony and knowing how to read what's going on inside the colony is that's always your answer. That's where the actual answer comes from. And your colony is different than anybody else's. So becoming mm -hmm. very intimate and familiar with your colony is going to give you the best chance of being the expert on your own colony. That's the <laughs> only way to go through and do it. To your point, slapping all ready-made solutions or silver bullets as a one size fits all is the worst way to keep your bees alive. You're not gonna be successful doing that. You're better off tuning in to the natural cycles of the superorganism and understanding what it is that drives any kind of changes and what the consequences are of what you see in the colony. Yep. And I think that I've, I've probably mentioned it before, but the um, Biology of the Honeybee by Winston, that book, is a great way to really understand that uh, that superorganism in a way that's not meant to be pushing any kind of beekeeping human beekeeper uh, agenda onto the bees. It's pure biology, so you get to learn. And then the other part is to observe and read and be in your colonies and stop and think. Just kind of get your lead from the bees, or you will never succeed. That's right. And by proxy you also have to then pay attention to not just the internal environment of the colony, but the external environment right. around them. Is there evidence of predators coming? Has something been digging around the base of the hive? Is there scratch marks on the hive? Um, you know, what's going on forage wise in your area? And then in an extension of that, what has your weather been? Because even if you see flowers, if it's raining every day, right. oh, bees can't point. get out. Yeah. They can't get out and get that nectar if it's constantly raining. So you have to take all of this into consideration before you jump to a conclusion as to, well, they're starving or they're not starving, or it's my queen that's the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all these different scenarios in there. Now, granted, 
there are times when yes, your queen is the problem. And right. if you've gone through and they're always feisty and you don't feel comfortable working them and it's not a one-off, then yes, requeening that colony may be the good solution for that. Right. And some... I will, Go ahead. I will add that there's dearth of um, uh, summer dryness and things, but to your point, rain dearth exists. When it rains all the time, there's not enough nectar to replenish and it gets washed away. And so if you have a week of, of raining, there might be flowers. You might see all kinds of flowers out there. It doesn't mean there's food for the bees. Right. Well, twofold on that one too, because if it's constantly raining, the bees can't leave to go get the food. There too. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as it stops raining, those plants need time to regenerate that nectar. So the first bees that do go out, they don't find anything. The shelves are empty. Well, so, that's the two day rain, one day sunshine, two day sunshine, two days rain. And usually that's not very good. That's kind of a dearth as well. Yeah, exactly. And then we, we experienced that actually like 2015-ish, I think. Uh, it rained so much. There was flowers everywhere, but colonies were starving. And mm -hmm. we didn't get a honey harvest. Anybody that had even remotely excess honey, we had to divide it up between all the other colonies because yeah. it just wasn't happening. But again, that's not the queen's fault. That's no. an environmental factor. That's and right. unfortunately, <laughs> in some scenarios, your colony may also sometimes jump to the same conclusions because you can't yeah, have okay. a colony that every now and then will be like, there's no food coming in. It's got to be somebody's fault. We're blaming her. And they will take out the queen and try to raise a new one to try to fix the problem. But unfortunately, just like us, that wasn't the solution. <laughs> right. And it's supersedure, right? They yeah. just kind of think that queen's at fault and they just replace her. Yep. It's got to be somebody's fault. So, you know, it's that primitive tribal thinking that we all went through way back eons ago. Okay. It's not raining. Let's sacrifice somebody to the gods. <laughs> A couple people there. <laughs> we'll yeah. <fix> it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I would say just if they are going through supersedure, uh, give them the opportunity to do that. You might not know exactly why they're superseding their queen, but they, they know unless that colony is looking really uh, problematic and there's other issues that you can actually observe. And at that point, that might be a last ditch effort for them to fix this, the problem. And they might need a new queen eventually because a supersedure queen is not going to be necessarily the best quality if it's done as an emergency. Right. It depends on, on again, the factors, the scenario that's going on, what they're, they're trying to do. If the queen inside the colony is not healthy, you may not be able to tell because she's moving around and she looks fine, but the bees can detect that and they can sense that. And they may then need to go through and raise a new queen to replace her. And yeah. if she's going through that process and you just go in and you're like, oh, I don't want these. And you remove all those supersedure cells, you mm -hmm. could actually be doing them a disservice because she could die soon after that. And maybe there's then no eggs to try to do that with, you know? So there's, there's lots of different scenarios. The same thing applies to swarm cells. Anytime you see a queen cell, swarm cell, supersedure cell, emergency, whatever, the very first thing you always should do is find your queen before you make any decisions whatsoever. Because if you immediately go in there and you say, I don't want them to swarm or I don't want this to happen and you remove all of those cells, but you didn't check for the queen, how do you know she's still there? Maybe she already left. Mm -hmm. And if she's already dead or she already flew the coop and took a swarm with her for more than two days. Yeah, yeah. And then you go and you remove all these queen cells. Now you've doomed your colony to death because there is no way for them to make a new queen. So what's going to happen? Right. They're going to turn into laying workers and then it's just going to spiral downhill and, and go very badly. So you, you always need that. to know what's yeah. going on inside the colony. And if you do that, they need to have eggs in the colony and if they don't, you need to give them eggs from another colony or plan to potentially requeen them at that point. Yeah. And that's assuming you're checking your colonies regularly and you mm -hmm. know what's going on inside there. Because if you don't, if you're only checking them once a month, then it's really hard to know some of these other factors. If it's been 30 days since you've been there, you may have caused it. You may have rolled the queen, like you said in one of your scenarios you may have rolled the queen, you may have squished her, you may have dropped her on the ground and then stepped on her and you didn't know it. And right. so then they went through this whole process and they've spent 30 days trying to fix it, but maybe it was in an inopportune time. Maybe they were in a dearth and she hadn't been laying and there wasn't eggs present. So again, knowing what's going on inside your colony and being present for that is very but key. To you, yeah, it, to your point, there's no reason for you to look for your queen 
all the time. You you always um, do the minimum possible intervention and uh, inspection if you can. Uh, rule of thumb is you should assume that your queen is in the colony unless you have done something that leads you to question or you see something that leads you to question that status. Yeah. At that point, you can go through the bird's nest and look for her if really you're in doubt. But if it looks good, if the bees are happy and things are going along fine and you reach the edge of the bird's nest and you see young larvae and eggs, there's no need to go any further because what happens when you do that's when you end up crushing or rolling the queen and dropping her out of the issues. colony, stepping and on her. And then you come back in three days and you've got a problem, right? right so right. whereas if you're mindful and just retreat and just kind of observe the minimum amount that you need to find out what the situation is, then you can come back in 30 days or, or you know, even more. Even if they swarmed on you, they have mechanisms to replace that queen and yep. they should be fine. So um when you do every two to three weeks, maybe even more, uh, don't necessarily look for your queen is, I guess, no. what I would like. Well, and that, that goes back to the <clears throat> definition of, of an inspection. So, and that's one of those other things from the very beginning that when you are first starting, you do want to go all the way through it because you need to understand what is what and, and how it's placed and get familiar with it. But it's detrimental to them. It's good for you, but it's detrimental to them. But once you start building that knowledge, an inspection isn't a 30 minute process. Mm -hmm. It isn't going through every comb in the yeah. colony. It is, what am I looking for today? If it's, are they grown to the point they need more space? Then you're just looking for where's the last drawn comb. If it is, are they still laying? You go to that outer edge of the brood's nest, you see eggs, you're done. You don't mm -hmm. have to go through and, and find the queen in all of those scenarios every time. It's nice to see her. It's great to know that she's there. But yes, to your point, that does not absolutely have to happen every time. And so when, when I say you're checking your colony every two to three weeks, that doesn't mean you're going through every single comb. It means okay. that you're still being a beekeeper. You're not being a front porch beekeeper. You're right. evaluating the scenarios. You know what's going on. If I ask you, hey, on this colony right here, how many frames does it have? You should mm -hmm. be able to tell me, well, we're up to 34 in this top bar right now, and they're almost out of space. Or, well, they're only about halfway full. They've got two or three new ones they were building out on the end. You know, the, the answer should never be, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I say something slightly different to our students. I say, you need to have more colonies so you don't have to go through all of them as deeply and as regularly and as often and you still get to learn because what matters is frame time the other way you can do this very efficiently is to get a mentor but not the way that people usually advise i would say instead what you need to do is create a beekeeping pod of people that are wanting to work with a mentor and you ask them you find a mentor for the pod, for the group of people. And instead of having that mentor go to every single yard to service, basically free service your, your colonies, right. <laughs> what you can do is ask them if you can go on their schedule, visit with them when they're going through their hives, and, and they will show you really quickly on many colonies what it is that you're looking for so that you don't have to go in your colonies every two, two weeks, right? Right. You, because it is very disruptive to your point. It's very detrimental to the colonies to go in there and look from front to back. Every time you do that, especially on a new colony, you're really asking for trouble. So, Well, and if you do that and you go along with somebody like yes. Natalie or myself, and you're looking through multiple colonies, that's going to kind of go along these lines. So you walk over to the first one, you open it up, you peek inside and you're like, oh, you, you know, they're still doing great. Looks like we got a little bit of extra space here. We got some new comb going. They're, they're awesome. Close it back up and walk away. You might've been in that colony for three minutes and you're already moving to the next one. You open it up and you look in there and immediately you're like, ah, something's not right here. There's, right. there's not as many bees as there should be. They seem to have declined. Right. Maybe their attitude's different. I see a lot of dead bodies on the bottom. Something mm -hmm. keys in to the beekeeper. And in that instance, that's the one you're like, okay, now we need to dig deeper. I need to mm -hmm. figure out what's going on here. Maybe I saw a lot of deformed wing, like immediately when I opened it up, or there was a funny smell or something that drones. was out of the ordinary. Drones, yeah. tons and tons of drones for no reason whatsoever. And none of your other colonies have them, you know? So <laughs> you then you start going in and you look and you maybe you pull out that first brood frame and you look at it. And you're like, oh, wow, all of the larva looks desiccated and brown. You know, maybe there's a problem there. Or maybe in the drone situation, 
there's tons of bullet cap drones everywhere in the middle of my worker cells, right? Mm -hmm. So now I need to keep looking. Is my queen present? Did she die? Do I have a drone laying queen or do I have a drone laying colony? You know, like what's exactly happened here? Did they go queenless or not? Those are the things that key you in and make you have to dig deeper. But Mm -hmm. that's only when you see something out of place or something doesn't appear to be on course with what it was over your previous inspections. Now, this is very valuable information, by the way, because this is how you want to approach any inspection, any colony that you open up. Uh, You have to have that critical thinking and that problem solving kind of mind and look for specific parameters and go through that analysis. It requires a lot of mental work. Uh, but it doesn't look that way. And so sometimes when an experienced beekeeper goes and, and uh, helps a customer with their colonies and they're in there for like two minutes per colony and the, the customer is like, well, I'm paying you all that money, but what, why are you in there for just this long? Well, because I can tell everything's all right. Yep. And if I go any further, I'm hurting your colony. So <laughs> that's kind of the, the, the thing to keep in mind. You don't have to go in there. And you have to go through that mental process before you decide to go crack it open that far. That's right. And it's not always your queen's fault. <laughs> Sometimes it's your fault. Sometimes right. it's mother nature's fault. Sometimes it's just a misunderstanding of the process that the bees naturally go through. But right. do not always have that knee-jerk reaction that the answer to the solution is requeen the colony. Because that that's right. not, requeening the colony is not always the answer. Sometimes it is, but not always. <laughs> oh, it's dangerous too, right? Uh, that requeening can go wrong. It can. And then you're left they with can a reject her. <laughs> they, yeah. they, can, they can kill her. There's all kinds of other issues that can happen. You had a perfectly there. good queen that you decided to dispatch and then all of a sudden it's not taking. They're not taking a new one. So you could actually be killing your colony if, uh, you know, in some instances. So just keep that in mind. It's not something to be doing lightly. No, the, the queen is she is the source of everything inside there. And Mm -hmm. so she should be given the most credit and the most consideration when you're deciding what you are or not going to do with her. So yeah, yeah, no, those are great scenarios. I really, I love the thinking because that's what we do when we're in the BR. That's right. right. It's exactly what we go through. All of this has to happen inside your head, Mm -hmm. all in a moment's notice when you go through and you look at a different colony. And you're absolutely right. There, There are times that, I can walk up to a colony that I know Mm -hmm. and I can immediately be like, "Eh, something's wrong Mm -hmm. because it's not the way that it always is. But going out and doing consultations and visiting clients hives, you can do the same scenario because you've seen so many different instances. I can pop open that hive and I can look at one frame and go, "Uh uh-oh. And they're Mm -hmm. like, what do you mean? "Uh Uh-oh, like we're not even in there, you know? And I'm like, I know, (laughs) but I already see all of these different things. And so my brain starts going down a checklist. Right. What's present, what's not present, what could be there, what could be wrong, what could have caused it. And right. then, you know, you go through and you try to find the answers to those. It's it's the same questions that a good mentor is going to ask you. Right. You're asking yourself in your head as you're going through and doing that inspection. So really, that was that was kind of the whole exercise here. The whole point of it was critical thinking. Be able to go through and evaluate the situation and the scenario and come up with the possible answers before having a knee-jerk reaction, before immediately dispatching your queen, because one time your colony was not in a good mood. (laughs) This is giving me an idea, and I don't know if I'll ever ever, uh, put it to to practice, but I want to build a decision-making flowchart. This is what I see. Yes, no, go this direction. And then just kind of, it's a little bit more complicated with colonies because there could be a variety of factors, but I want to give it a fact. Yes, I want to give it a stab, uh, kind of like a, uh, a decision making, not just a, a checklist, but just kind of a, okay, a yes, go to this section, yeah. go to this section if it's the other option, yeah. uh, and, and then take it from there to help facilitate the analysis of what's going on. Yeah, no, that's that's cool. actually, that, oh, man, that could end up being very large. Yes, but that could also be very useful, right? So I don't know if it's possible, but you know, if anybody's going to try doing that, <laughs> I mean, crazy friend girl, right? As you said at the very beginning, it's not like you've got anything else going on. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I'll wait a little bit before I put that together. Maybe so. Maybe, maybe get this, this first project that's currently pending out of the way, and then you've got time to work on that. Or, or maybe it's one of those 
you sit down in the evenings and you know you got a little bit of free time and so you just jot down some of the scenarios and start a cache of it so it kind of grows as you go my problem is that I sabotage myself i come up with these great ideas that actually are very often very useful uh, to myself or potentially others and then I run with that because my brain is bubbling and then I just kind of like oh, this is such a ep epiphany and, and let's do this and it's like practical and everything and then I have no time to prepare for my presentation tomorrow right, right. so I'll spend the whole night finishing my awesome <laughs> inspiring project and then I'll have five minutes to do my presentation slide yeah, yeah. and that that yeah. project was just a poof that happened all of a sudden like exactly. an hour ago <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly this is what just happened by the way Jens uh, I saw you <laughs> she comes over like you'll you'll notice on the video if you're watching the video yeah. whoever's talking is who you see so when I'm talking sometimes what you don't see is all of a sudden she'll light up and her eyes will get big and all of a sudden she'll start taking notes <laughs> and she's she, writing <laughs> down I'm taking notes so I'm like okay we can can use that later <laughs> yep yeah let's see that's uh, it's it's fun. It definitely is. I I have those instances where I'll get into some mindset. Uh, one of the ones that plagued me for the longest time was developing better two queen systems. Hmm. And I would go to bed and have sleepless nights because it was a perfect day, and I would lay down. And as soon as I'd start to go to sleep, all of a sudden the gears would start turning. Well, what if I designed the colony like this, and I had the queens and chambers like this, and then we merged it together like that? And I would be designing and building like all new structures of things, and then at like three o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, oh my god, stop! Yeah. <laughs> well, I totally relate because that's what happened with the conversions from Langstroth nukes and putting the legs under the hive and all that good stuff. That was that's what happened. I many sleep less nights thinking about it but what the best you can do john when that happens is that get up and write it down and go back to bed make because you notes. don't want to forget those ideas yeah make some and, notes yeah. get it out of your head mm -hmm. and then try to get some sleep <laughs> that's right that's right yeah so but that well, was so awesome yeah i i hope that this helped everybody out and and gave you some things to consider before making those types of choices and judgments and helps you start developing these thought processes in your own beekeeping so that you don't just go by what the Facebook forum says, take mm -hmm. into consideration your unique scenario and surroundings, and then implement different things based on that and trust in your own knowledge from what you're seeing. If something mm -hmm. doesn't feel right or something doesn't look right, you may have a perspective that, you know, Joe Blow out there on Facebook's not going to have because they don't know the scenario. So right. Sometimes it is better to go through and actually think through the whole process, what could also be the problem, and then narrow it down to the best solution for your situation. So, And don't forget to take pictures and videos, because when people ask questions online, uh, that's what's missing the most, really, with those, along with those explanations that you mentioned. And yeah. a picture is worth a thousand words very often. So just take good shots and not just like from 10 feet away, but just like really... <laughs> the whole frame possibly uh, that would be great <laughs> yeah you know if you see something in the colony that looks odd try to get a good clear picture of that and then send that to your mentor and say what is this because words and the way that we describe things can vary drastically from one individual to the next so if my mom were to go and look inside a colony and see a drone cell or a queen cell the way that she might try to describe that to me may conjure up images of other things entirely that are not even remotely close. But if she took a picture and sent it and said, what is this right. cell? I can say, oh, that's a queen cup. That's whatever, you know, or that's a drone cell where it shouldn't be. You can, you know, go through and get that easy instant answer because then somebody can physically see what you're trying to describe and that helps so yes pictures well, do speak a thousand words and it defeats the whole dunning-kruger effect that we talked about before right where people that have less than about three years experience will think they know what they're looking at and they'll tell you all this stuff and the experienced beekeeper that is going to assume that these people are uh, know what they know as well will run with those descriptions and assumptions to provide their conclusions and it's there's a disconnect here and you might end up with um, somebody that's very experienced that has the information that needs to analyze the, the situation give you an answer that's wrong because you assumed it was something different and you described it as such right, right. oh that i saw i saw uh, queen cells everywhere well those were drone cells in worker a drone drone uh, larvae in worker cells for example that's a, an example but 
don't assume and just use the pictures. Uh, that's always the best for anybody to communicate. Yeah, that's 100% right there with you. I agree. Always take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> I tell yeah. that to anybody that I'm mentoring too. If you have a question, feel free to reach out, but send right. me a picture. <laughs> that's right. All right, everybody. Well, again, I hope that this little discussion has helped you come up with different ways to think about how you are addressing and approaching your beekeeping. And we look forward to talking to you again soon. But until then, be good. Be mindful. (laughs) (laughs) Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. This Hive Jive production was made possible by amazing patrons like you. And we appreciate your support. To all our Hive Jive junkies out there, you truly are the bee's knees. <laughs>